Okay, I'm going to allow people to join as we do introductions because I believe Jonathan has a pretty robust presentation today for us. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another Davis lecture. Uh, the Center of Health Administration Studies has always championed health research and services policy through innovative and evolving tech. Chaz, Chaz continues to make the latest health and research topics accessible to as many people as possible. In a moment, GFAP faculty director and SSA professor Colleen Grogan will offer brief opening remarks and provide an introduction of today's lecture. Computational scientist at Argonne National Laboratory and senior scientist in the Consortium for Advanced Science and Engineering, CASE, at the University of Chicago, Jonathan Ozick. To keep continu continuity and to allow Jonathan to focus on presenting, we will be fielding questions to be answered at the end of the slideshow. If you have questions during the presentation, please enter those questions in the Zoom Q&A pane, and we will moderate those questions following the slideshow. A copy of today's PowerPoint will be archived on the Chaz website, and the video content will be featured on the Chaz YouTube channel. And now Dr. Grogan will introduce today's speaker. Okay, great. Thanks, Keith. Um, so it's our pleasure to welcome Jonathan Orzik today. Um, as Keith already said, Jonathan is a computational scientist at Argonne National Labs and is a senior scientist at the Consortium for Advanced Science and Engineering here at the University of Chicago. If you examine his um, very intimidating bio sketch, um, you will see a remarkable range of accomplishments and projects ranging from HIV, hepatitis, and cancer prevention to COVID-19 um, on top of the most recent research. Um, and quote, temporal strain structure and response to interventions in a high en endemicity region of Plasmodium falciparum, end quote. So whatever that is, but that's in his bio sketch. <laughs> So John has close ties to many of us here through his work with Harold Pollack, John Schneider, Diane Lauderdale, and others in public health sciences um, and SSA. He helps to lead the advanced methods and research core at the university's new NIDA funded methodology and advanced analytics research center or the acronym is MARC. Um, with some colleagues here, he is examining the impact of harm reduction interventions on the prevention of opiate overdose among individuals with lived experience in the criminal legal system. Jonathan will be speaking with us about his public health work and agent-based modeling. Um, it is a critical set of tools in modeling complex dynamic phenomena in a range of fields, most definitely including um, current challenges in prevent preventing the spread of infectious disease. Um, so very, very relevant for today. So can't wait to hear what you have to say, Jonathan. Um, welcome. Thank you, Colleen. Um, so the, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, today, what I'll attempt to answer is this question, which is how can agent-based modeling support public health goals? Um, we'll see how well I do, um, but I will try to do this by showing you some applications, uh, and I've chosen a few uh, to delve a little deeper into, and some of the um, others, uh, as time permits, to look at specifically how to reduce health inequities. Um, okay, and the uh, project that you mentioned is a malaria project with uh, with uh, Mercedes Pasquale. So thank you. Um, okay. So this is the outline. I don't know how much of this I'll get through, but first and foremost, I want to introduce people to agent-based modeling, what it is, uh, why we do it, uh, and also introduce the, the folks on the, on the call here to our team-based research approach. Um, and this is, you know, I hope to argue that this is necessary for complex interconnected problems that public health people face every day. Um, it's, it's, it's become an easier argument to make for obvious reasons, but um, it is what it is. So um, applications, I will go, uh, I will provide some hepatitis C applications, uh, looking at the importance of retreatment uh, to those most vulnerable. Uh, also computational discovery of combination intervention, something that is 
uh, somewhat unique to the type of modeling approaches that we take. And then uh, looking at medication for opioid use disorder in addition to hepatitis C. And as time permits, I, can, I will go over uh, additional projects, including HIV, health information, and COVID spread projects. Um, and then uh, describe some ongoing and newer work uh, on health inequities as well. Okay, so uh, my goal here is to convey just enough technical detail for a general audience. And I've also included uh, information about uh, papers and other resources for those that are interested in uh, exploring further. And please feel free to email me um, uh, if you are interested. Okay, without further ado, agent-based modeling, what is it? Uh, well, it's a disaggregated uh, approach to describe complex systems. And so we take um, uh, compute system level consequences of behaviors of sets of individuals. And because the approach is computational, we can run the system under different assumptions. Okay, so on the left here, I have um, what are the four basic components of an agent-based model. The protagonist is the agent here. I hope you can see my cursor. Um, uh, an agent can have attributes that are static or dynamic. They can also have behaviors and self-directed goals. Uh, and then agents interact with other agents where they can exchange information or infect other agents. And they do this in some sort of environment. And the environment defines the relationships that agents can have with each other. So for this simple cartoon uh, environment, which I call a social interaction space, uh, agents can be uh, geographically close to other agents, or they can be far away, but and yet connected through networks. And so they can interact through networks or through proximity. Um, and finally, agents can uh, sense information on the environment, and they can also affect the environment and thereby uh, affect other agents through the environment as well. So this is the very cartoon uh, depiction of an agent-based model. And the agent-based models that we tend to create are more uh, embedded in data, both geographic, network, uh, epidemiologic, et cetera. They have, the agents tend to have a lot of heterogeneity as well, uh, uh, just enough to capture the phenomena uh, that we're trying to model. So a few more words about the uh, agents that we'll be talking about a lot. So agents, as I said, have individual attributes. They have their own behaviors. And so they are autonomous. There is no central authority that's telling them what to do. And so they engage in decentralized behaviors. Um, as I said, agents have interactions and they can act on local information. This is really important because not every agent knows what every other agent is doing at any one time. Um, these, this is generally restricted either through the networks that they connect with other agents with or some, again, geographic proximity. Uh, and the environment can be dynamic as well. Uh, and it can be geographic, it can be network-based, and it can also be more abstract uh, environments uh, as well, like um, how close in belief you are to another agent for, for uh, models that look at belief space. And then uh, finally, emergence. So the idea of emergence is old, uh, and it used to refer to even simple rules being able to lead to sufficient complexity. But the truth is that modern agent-based models are actually not very simple at all, and they have very complex uh, rules that underlie them, okay? And so what occurs is that there's self-organization of the patterns and structures in the model, and what emerges from a model is something that is not explicitly programmed into the model. So this is something that is fundamentally different from many modeling approaches uh, that we see. So what's the utility of agent-based modeling in public health applications? Uh, so it allows us to create an analytical platform for integrating disparate data sources. And these data sources could be about individuals, 
about how they connect to each other, about where they live, and about what resources they know about, for example. Um, a really important uh, component of agent-based modeling is that you can actually put in plug-in theories, so causal mechanism at different uh, it, at different scales. So they, these could involve uh, theories about the micro or individual level or some meso level or a macro level. And you're able to run these uh, hypotheses and see what the outputs tell you about whether you know one is closer to empirical reality or not, for example. Um, and this is something that other traditional epidemiologic and statistical methods have a harder time doing. Um, because it's a computational approach, we're also able to use sensitivity analysis to guide either expensive or difficult data collection. So this, would, this is where the model is telling us where we should be looking, where we should be spending our uh, finite resources um, to collect more data because it's important to the phenomena that we're modeling. And then as we have improved our ability to do large scale computation, which I will talk about a little later, um, agent-based models can increasingly be used to understand the uncertainties that underlie, for example, the input parameters uh, to our models and the outcomes of interest. Um, and then, uh, yes, and a very important point is that uh, because we have this computational platform, we're able to evaluate interventions and combinations and even sequences of interventions that would be really impossible to, in to, to implement in the real world due to cost or effort or ethical or logistical considerations. Um, and finally, we are able to then find priority subpopulations for intervention focus using these approaches. So I promised it would be a teams-based science slide, and so this is it. And so um, agent-based modeling is inherently interdisciplinary and team-based. Uh, so just to take an examples from the, the examples in this lecture, uh, we have people that are experts in hepatitis C, opioid use disorder, HIV, COVID-19. We have people that have clinical background, public health background, epidemiology. Um, and all these are really needed to uh, tackle these complex and interconnected systems that are being faced by public health uh, people, right? And so what do we add to this mix uh, you know, of wonderful expertise? It's both the ability to communicate across uh, traditionally siloed, uh, uh, traditionally siloed um, uh, areas of research, but also to provide exploits in uh, advanced simulation, machine learning, and high-performance computing and have them apply to agent-based model. So I'm going to briefly go over um, these three aspects, simulation, machine learning, and high-performance computing, and then I will turn to the applications. So, um, oh. so uh, we have been uh, publishing, and I lead the Repass suite of agent-based modeling toolkits, which are free and open source uh, toolkits that allow us and other people, importantly, to build agent-based models. And so these provide novel methods to specify agent behaviors, um, ways to visualize the complexity in the models, and also, um, oops, sorry, going ahead. And also, uh, we work very hard to improve the performance of our simulations. Um, we're also looking to uh, constantly seeking to find ways to extend the sophisticated methods that we create to a wider audience and then recently published this, um, uh, this, this uh, paper on the bottom right, Experiences in Developing a Distributed Agent-Based Modeling Toolkit with Python that we'll be presenting later this week at the um, supercomputing conference. Uh, so second is machine learning. So we apply a lot of machine learning methods to understand our simulations. And I have three examples here that I just uh, picked from what we do. The leftmost one is looking at uh, using uh, random forest surrogate models to identify in a, a sequential manner regions in our parameter space that are, uh, I don't know why this is 
advancing automatically. Maybe I'll pause it so it stops doing that. Um, um, so it looks at regions of the parameter space that correspond to empirical reality. Uh, and actually, the, the left, the, that left panel uh, forms the basis of a lot of our uh, current uh, COVID modeling work. The middle example is an example I'll come back to later in the presentation, but we use evolutionary methods to do multi-objective optimization. In this case, we look at combinations of interventions uh, to understand uh, the basically pros and cons of different combinations and which combinations of interventions provide cheap, cheap ways of doing things that are maybe not as effective or more expensive uh, ways of doing things that are more effective. And finally, the, the third panel looks at multi-objective Bayesian optimization. And this is uh, something that is, um, I, I'll say a little bit more in the next slide. So in order to, um, in order to uh, use machine learning methods on our uh, you know, uh, complex, sophisticated simulation, we use high-performance computing. Uh, on the top left is our uh, uh, Aurora supercomputer that once it uh, becomes, uh, it's, once it's completed at Argonne uh, next year will be the most powerful public uh, science computer on the planet. Um, we, we believe that's still the case. Um, and uh, so we work with uh, resources like Aurora or resources that predate Aurora, like our current supercomputer Theta, to run these mixed simulation and machine learning workflows. And in fact, we were nominated as finalists for a Gordon Bell Special Prize for High Performance Computing Based COVID 19 Research, and we're presenting. Uh, uh, presentation on this and supercomputing next week. Okay, so that's what we bring. And so what happens when you bring subject matter expertise and computational expertise together? So the first application that I want to talk about is about hepatitis C and the project is called HEPCEP and I'll explain what that is in a second. So as promised, HEPCEP is an interdisciplinary team uh, it uh, combines people from Loyola, Harel Dahari, who's an expert in in-host modeling, hepatology, HCV dynamics, Basmati Budram and her team at UIC, who does meta-analyses, public policy, epidemiology, sociology, Marion Major at FDA, who does virology and immunology, and me and the many people that I work with at Argonne and the University of Chicago. And so this project called Computational Discovery of effective hepatitis C intervention strategies uh, is funded by the NIH. So what does HEPCEP stand for? It stands for hepatitis C elimination in people who inject drugs, PUID. Um, and so we use Asian-based models to simulate the PUID population in metropolitan Chicago, including their social interactions that result in HCV infection. The reason why we use agent-based modeling is to account for the complex interplay of demographic factors, risk behaviors, social networks, and geographic locations for HCV transition. And the goal is to identify and optimize detailed implementations of direct acting antiviral or DAA therapy scale-up and treatment strategies needed for approval. And just as an aside, HEPCEP was developed with uh, repast HPC. So uh, on the right here, we see a, a picture from earlier in the presentation, and these are actual PUID agents, and the lines represent co-injection links uh, where the uh, colors on the agents indicate whether they're uninfected PUIDs or PUIDs that were successfully treated. Red are the chronic uh, HCV PUIDs, and green are those who spontaneously cleared their um, acute HCV infection. So a few words about the model itself. So who are the agents? So we have 32,000 uh, people inject drugs, and these are sampled from uh, a synthetic population of PUIDs, which are, they number 100,000. And every time we try to um, keep the population constant, and so every time a PUID uh, moves out of the population, we sample a new one from this base synthetic population. Each of these PUIDs has uh, attributes, and these include their age, 
the age that they started injecting drugs, their gender, race, zip code, syringe source. Uh, for example, do they get them from harm reduction uh, locations? HCV infection status, drug sharing network degree, so how many people they share drugs with, and parameters for daily injection rates and syringe sharing. Now, their networks, uh, their, their PUID networks, their formation is determined by the probability of two persons encountering each other in their neighborhood of residence or in outdoor drug purchasing market areas in Chicago or through random interactions with any other individuals. Sorry for the background noise. Uh, empirical data provides numbers of in-network PUID partners who provide syringes and out-network PUID partners who receive syringes from them. And of course, this is important because directionality is what determines HCV transmission. Uh, finally, network connect connections have an average lifespan after which they're destroyed and new connections are probabilistically formed. So to add some more uh, information of the um, underlying data for this, we use NHPS data, uh, YSN, um, uh, network data, Chicago area geography, and also for the purpose of uh, validating the original model, we used NHBS 2012 data for validation purposes. Now, uh, there's a lot more detail associated with these data sources and how they were used to create the synthetic population. And for those interested, I've included a reference to uh, a paper below. Um, okay, so the first study we did uh, that I'll present is on retreatment, HEPCEP retreatment. So what we're trying to do here is project the frequency of retreatment, and that's, that is uh, treating somebody that has already been treated before and that treatment has either failed or it was successful, but the person got reinfected. Uh, so frequency of retreatment and DAA cost needed to achieve WHO goals, and the WHO goals are one of them at least is a 90% reduction of chronic infection incidence by 2030. And so why is this an important topic? Well, so while DAA treatment is highly efficacious, some payers still restrict access to DAAs and prohibit DAA retreatment of those who become reinfected once cured by DAA therapy. And this is particularly an issue with high-risk individuals such as people who inject drugs. So a few assumptions. So we assume that the treatment success for uh, sustained virological response, or SVR, is at 90%. So that 10% roughly uh, fail in their treatment. And so they're not able to suppress, uh, um, uh, suppress the, the infection. Um, then we varied the, uh, the adherence rate. So this is more of a behavioral aspect. You know, some agents may behave better and adhere to their, um, to their treatment uh, better than others. Uh, so we wanted to adjust that and see what the implications are. And we also enrolled different at different levels of intensities, going from 2.5% yearly of the food population to 10%. Then we varied the retreatments per PUID from zero, where we prohibited retreatment, and to one, two, and three, or no retreatment restrictions at all. And uh, for the purpose of this study, DAA costs were assumed to be $25,000 uh, per treatment. So looking at the agent perspective, this is an activity timeline for a single agent who was only allowed four courses of DAA therapy. So they were retreated three times. Um, so we show different activities that can occur. So one, of course, is the red infected bar at the very top. Um, and so this agent was infected. And then the blue bar indicates a successful treatment. Um, and then we have the green where the agent was cured and so remains cured. Until uh, in early 2021, the agent again gets infected then gets uh, enrolled into treatment very soon thereafter. It's successful and they are cured until early 2022. Then an infection occurs, the, the, the treatment occurs not too, not too late after that, but it's unsuccessful. And then a subsequent treatment is successful and the agent is cured. And finally, 
the agent has exhausted their allotment of retreatments. And so when they get reinfected, they continue to be reinfected. Okay, so we are able to track individual agents in this model and thereby generate these types of timelines. So what did we find? So the main <laughs> important result is when we simulated with uh, when we simulated our PUIDs and we did not allow any retreatment. So we said that once you get infected, that's it. Once you get treated, it doesn't matter if you get infected, you will not be retreated. There was no enrollment level <laughs> that could actually achieve the WHO goal of 90% reduction of chronic infections. And that's the dotted red line at the bottom, right? So we're increasing from 2.5% enrollment all the way to 10%, but they all plateau at about 50% uh, re uh, incidence reduction. But this is very different if we do allow retreatment. So if we don't have any prohibition on retreatment, then even the previous slide was at an adherence level of 90%, but even if we reduce the adherence level all the way down to 60%, there are still conditions where for 7.5 and 10% enrollment uh, intensities, we still reach the WHO goal. And certainly we reach them even with 5% for the 90% adherence situation. So this is interesting because, you know, from an administrative point of view, uh, it's easier to not track how many times somebody <laughs> gets retreated rather than, um, you know, whether they have been retreated or how many times they're retreated. So what's happening underneath the covers here? So this is a table that shows the total number of people uh, that received treatment and how many subsequent retreatments they, they received in this uh, no inhibition for retreatment scenario. Well, what we see is there is a dramatic drop off of retreatments so that, you know, beyond four retreatments, there are not very many people. And as a result, it doesn't really add up to much in terms of costs. Um, what we have seen, and I, 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 I'm not showing it in this presentation, is that um, when you do prohibit retreatment, you're actually potentially incurring more costs because people that could have been retreated uh, and, and thereby not spread infection throughout the rest of the population are actually spreading infection throughout the population. Other people need to be treated then as a result. Another point that I want to make is that you might ask, so what is the benefit of taking all the time to create a detailed agent-based model in order to uh, tackle something like this that you could do with a simpler model that makes you know, many more simplifying assumptions. So we actually did that. We did a comparison study using ordinary differential equations, uh, looking at the, uh, again, no restriction on retreatment scenario. And what we found there is that the cost to achieve the WHO goal is 430 million rather than the 325 uh, million estimated cost that we got out of the agent-based modeling study. So if somebody asks you, you know, this is not always the case. There are some problems where things like network and dynamics across networks and geography don't matter as much. And so in those cases, it might be beneficial to just take a simpler, simple approach. But in our case, we have indications that this uh, more complex approach actually does have benefits. Uh, in this case, you know, potentially financial, large financial benefits. So the second study that I want to talk about in, in uh, directly in the hepatitis C world is this combining of interventions. So there are uh, five separate recruitment strategies that we considered, and we wanted to see what if we um, uh, combine them in arbitrary ways, can we find optimal combinations to, in order to reduce the incidence rate in our population? So uh, the first um, enrollment method is random recruitment. So we just select HCV infected individuals from the full PUID population, and we keep selecting them until we hit the uh, recruitment um, uh, allowance uh, for that day for that recruitment method. Okay, so the next 
approach is the harm reduction program. So we are differentially recruiting people who are associated with harm reduction pro programs who provide to them sterile syringe injection equipments uh, and counseling. So in a sense, these are agents that are, while they are PUIDs, they, are, uh, they represent uh, reduced risk of infection compared to the general population. And then there's the full network enrollment, which uh, when once you pick somebody that is infected, you follow all the in and out connections of that person and enroll all of them in their local network. Uh, and you keep doing this for each uh, infected randomly recruited person that you find. Um, and so what you're trying to do is to really flood the network of the uh, the agents that you have found that happen to be uh, infected. And then there's the in partner network where you uh, you start by randomly selecting somebody, but then look upstream, look to see who is sharing uh, needles with them, and then enroll just one of them, one of those people. So even if that person has multiple people that are sharing needles with them, you are grabbing one of them. And then the out partner network is the inverse of that, where you're looking at who this person shares network uh, shares syringes with. Okay, I'm monitoring the time. I think we're still good. So, what did we find? Uh, what did we do? So, we uh, ran this, as I mentioned earlier, multi-objective uh, optimization using evolutionary algorithms, where we iteratively sample this parameter space, and at the end. What we did was we're varying the total enrollment rates, uh, so we're 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 uh, we're increasing the intensity or decreasing the intensity of the uh, of the total intervention. But what we're also doing is is uh, partitioning that total intervention into these five different types of intervention, and then seeing um, what so for example for a given uh, treatment count how low can we get the incidence rate uh, for our population? And so one thing to note is that um, not all of the parameter space, uh, not all of the solutions that we found were relevant to the WHO goal. Only the bottom right uh, solutions right here were um, under the WHO goal. So that's, that's one point. Uh, the other point is that the successful solutions were ones where um, uh, we exploited this in partner structure and also the full network. So this is a combination of uh, making sure that you're getting the highest risk. If somebody is infected, then and they get infected by somebody by sharing needles, then it's a good idea to look upstream, right? Now you might not get catch all the upstream people, but it still seems like it's a you know nice directed way to uh, handle this, but also combining that with a full network flooding of the local network of an individual, while you might waste a lot of uh, treatment uh, for recruitment, um, you still get a lot of people. Uh, and so what we found is that this combination of in-partner and full network yielded the best results that also uh, met the, the WHO goals. Okay, so um, changing fo uh, focus a little bit, but you'll see not very much, uh, looking at opioid use disorder. So this project is uh, a project that we're doing with uh, uh, a number of wonderful people, including Marinia and Kenyon from the Center for Spatial Data Science, uh, again, Harel and Basmati from Loyola and USC, respectively, John Schneider at CCHE, and Eric Tatara and Nick Collier uh, at Argonne. And the funding for this is both from the MARC uh, Center and also from the HEPSA project. So here what we're looking at is uh, the notion of spatial health inequity. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to look at three separate MOUD interventions, methadone, naltrexone, and buprenorphine, and using different level, different scenarios with varying levels of spatial health inequity, and I'll say a bit more what that means, using the HEPCEP model as actually the substrate for this analysis. We wanted to look at access to MOUD resources. So each individual 
would have a certain uh, ability to uh, access or otherwise or or not uh, a resource that would then provide them with methadone, naltrexone, or buprenorphine. Um, so the data for the resource locations themselves was derived from SAMHSA and some cross-validation was done with IDPH data as well. So thinking about what the agents see, so the HEPSET agents will periodically make decisions about continuing uh, an MOUD, MOUD treatment that they happen to be on. And so the cadence of this decision-making it, we tie it to the typical requirements for clinic visits for each of the MOUD interventions. So for methadone, it would it, we've been using seven days. For buprenorphine, we've been using either seven or 30 days. And for naltrexone, we've been using 30 days. So each seven or 30 days, the agent makes a decision about whether to continue with their treatment. Um, and this decision is based on the agent's access to the service, where better access uh, increases the average agent treatment duration. So if they keep agreeing to continue their treatment, the overall treatment duration increases. Seems pretty obvious. Um, when agents are in treatment, they have fewer injection drug use events, and those lead to a reduction in disease transmission. Uh, and we also differentiate the access threshold. So what does an agent considers close or far depends on whether they're in they live in an urban area or a suburban area and on what MOUD type um, uh, they are, uh, what MOUD type they are on. So in order to understand how spatial distributions of MOUD lo locations affect health outcomes, we generated three counterfactual scenarios. So these are the MOUD locations are reshuffled uh, according to some criteria. And there are three uh, different reshufflings that we did. So I'll skip to the three here, which is spatially random, where the MOUDs are randomly uniformly distributed. Uh, Needs-based one, where we assign MOUDs proportional to the adult population, which is at risk of H A Hep C for each zip code. And also, uh, need base two is when we assign MOUDs proportional to the PUID population for each zip code. So the more PUID, the more MOUD for that zip code area. So let's look at the uh, at, at what we see um, when we do these different um, uh, distributions of resources. So here we're just looking at the spatial distribution. So there's no agents, nothing at all. We're just moving uh, MOUD clinics to two different zip codes. And what we're comparing is between the real distribution and either the spatially random or the need-based one or the need-based two scenario. And so the immediate takeaway is that both for South and West Chicago, where there are where there's a higher density and also where there are more PUIDs, um, we see that there is a you know a greening of, of some of parts of that area. Okay, so basically we're confirming that the distribution is doing what we assume, you know, what, we, what we think it should do. Second, we're looking here at access. And so this depends on an agent's, where an agent lives. And so if an agent lives in an urban uh, area, in this case for methadone, if the clinic is under, the closest clinics is under two miles, then the clinic is considered close, otherwise it's far. And for the suburban agent, the threshold that we use for this visualization is 10. Uh, and so what we see again in the south and west side compared to the random distribution uh, for methadone, we see that the access is greatly increased as, you know, as expected. Now, one of the interesting things we're finding is that different spatial distributions optimize access to different types of medication. So while uh, for methadone, the need-based one seems to have the most zip codes that um, have good access, um, the, in the case of buprenorphine, the spatially random provides the best result. And for the naltrexone case, the real scenario provides the best result. Um, now, we have ongoing work to dive a little bit deeper, and we're writing uh, this work up uh, in a paper as we speak, 
Uh, so hopefully we'll be able to give uh, more meaningful results that way. But one of the things that we see is that the health outcomes that's our you know, primary interest here do vary substantially across different experimental settings. And so just to give an example, the, uh, for the uniformly random distributed case, uh, if for the treatment duration of methadone, this increases in 60% of all zip code areas, uh, and the new HCV chronic infection rate would actually decrease in 33% of areas uh, by the 2030 uh, goal. Um, and so now, as I said, we're, we are doing additional investigations of this, but the um, upshot here is that, you know, as health departments co-locate AMOUD services with other existing infrastructure, um, something like this, this type of approach can provide optimal selection of locations and sites um, and provides enough complexity to handle different types of MOUD, different types of residences, different types of uh, agents as well. Okay, so we have a few more minutes. So I will briefly go over, um, and you know, I apologize, this, this will be quick, um, three other projects and then three other ongoing projects. So one of the projects is work we're doing with uh, John Schneider at CCHE and others, including Naina Harawa at UCLA and Kaio Fujimoto at UT Houston, where we're looking at uh, young black MSM that have some criminal justice involvement and we're, we, we know that they are disproportionately impacted by HIV and criminal justice involvement as they cycle between community and criminal settings. And what we're focused on is how these breaks in their networks of connections that exist before uh, jail and after jail uh, affect things like the HIV prevention and care continuum. Um, so on the right, we have a figure showing incidence rates across subpopulations of this uh, uh, within the model, the BARS model that we created, where the topmost purple line uh, are the post-release partners. So an interesting thing that we're finding is that, you know, rather than focus just on the people who are incarcerated, if we go one step further and look at the, their partners, either those that were partnering with them prior to incarceration or after incarceration, we see that they could be a very um, good target for things like um, uh, risk reduction of uh, either getting people on PrEP, uh, for example. Um, yeah, I mean, that's the best example I can think of. Uh, and we've also done a lot of uh, studies uh, with the BARS model to change the, the different parameters of uh, interventions that we're applying to the uh, to the agents as well. So that's the bottom two panels. Um, we also have done work where what's transmitted is information rather than any sort of infectious disease. And this is work with Stacy Lindau and others. Um, uh, and uh, here, as I said, we're trying to understand um, the how information about resources that people can use to improve their health conditions that is a particular issue with the south side of Chicago where such information is traditionally not very well known. So providing this information to people and having people spread it around was thought to be uh, a good way to increase people's ability to manage their health. And so what we did is we um, looked at how agents receive information either through peers or through their healthcare provider, or um, get more familiar with a resource by using it. And we basically, the e e EKG type uh, graphic on the bottom there is we are peering into each agent's understanding of different resources in their, uh, in their communities. And the different up upticks and downticks occur um, as they receive additional information either from peers or trusted resources or, utility, or use of those resources. And then finally, um, we've been doing uh, a lot of COVID-19 modeling work with a city scale model uh, where we have 2.7 million people in Chicago moving between uh, 1.2 million locations where they can infect each other 
with COVID. Um, so we've been doing this work since early March, uh, looking at different policy questions. Uh, we're part of the Illinois COVID-19 Modeling Task Force and also um, have regular uh, conversations with the Chicago Department of Public Health and the Cook County Department of Public Health, uh, both about policy topics and also epidemiology topics as well. Okay. And finally, uh, I wanted to make sure to mention these three uh, really exciting projects that are very much in the health inequities area. Uh, so uh, Colleen mentioned this earlier, but um, as part of the MARC project, we're building a justice community circulation model. Um, and this is looking uh, at the intersection of opioid use disorder and CJI uh, and uh, the opportunities for um, uh, subselecting uh, very specific interventions that could nonetheless have large effects on, on this population. The second project is funded by the C3AI Digital Transformation Institute, and it's led by Anna Hott in the University of Chicago, also part of CCHE, where we're extending the city COVID, uh, COVID modeling agent-based model, specifically to look at social determinants of health and their effect on transmission and mortality um, in the context of health inequities. And finally, a relatively new project with uh, Michelle Burkett and others at Northwestern, uh, where we're using uh, agent-based modeling to simulate, uh, to understand and address HIV disparities in racial, ethnic, and sexual minority populations. Okay, and that's all I have for the presentation, but I'm uh, more than happy to take questions. Okay, that's... Um... That was really interesting. Thanks so much. Um, so we have uh, one question in the question and answer. Uh, it's not in the chat, but for all of those in the audience, feel free to um, put in more questions into the chat or the Q&A, um, and I'll kind of try to field those. Um, I have several questions, but why don't I go ahead and start with the one that's, um, that's already in here. Um, this is a a question from David Innes, um, and he asks, um, could this be productively employed to model um, gun violence interventions? To, to give a very uh, quick answer, and then I can now elaborate, the quick answer is yes, uh, absolutely. Um, this is something that we've been trying to do with a few of our partners, um, uh, with, with uh, Gary Ahn, who used to be at uh, um, at U Chicago Surgery, now University of Vermont, with uh, Bob Gergi at Chapin Hall and others, uh, and Anna Houghton as well. We've been trying to look at violence and gun violence in particular would be uh, part of that as well. Uh, also, I should mention Mark Berman and his work on urban green infrastructure and uh, its, its intersection with violence topics and stuff. So absolutely, yes, I think it's a very exciting area that I would very much like to, um, to make, to create a, uh, a proposal that somebody actually funds. Well, that's, um, that's it's, it's fascinating work and incredibly useful to be able to um, model these, this, you know, the various levels of successfulness of these, of these interventions, right? Is kind of one way that, that I think of it. Um, I guess what that leads me to ask um, are a couple different questions, but um, one is, um, you know, a lot of times we have really good, really good evidence about the success of different interventions. And um, in one of your studies, you obviously looked at um, opiate use disorder and, um, you, you know, you just introduced, you just went over that study where you were looking at, um, the um, treatment treatment sites for getting access to um, opiate use disorder medications, so methadone, buprenorphine, or naltrexone, um, it, it can, you know, it makes absolute sense to me that there's enough evidence in the literature that you can model. You can move then onto okay, where we, we we don't have to simulate the success of the drug. We already have enough evidence for that, but we we're going to simulate access to getting that treatment um, and then try to understand how we can change the distribution of facilities 
to be more effective is sort of, that's, that's my way of understanding that study. Hopefully that was right. Um, so I guess um, on that, on those lines, one question I have is, um, it seems to me that that's where I see the most value is when there's already enough evidence about the effectiveness of a particular intervention. And so in some ways, what I see you doing is, uh, you know, if you were gonna scale it up, it's that you don't, there's lots of different ways in which this intervention it could be it could be impacted once you try to scale up in the community and you're trying to model those different um, interactions that may occur in the environment that are uh, where the range of behaviors is less clear. Is that right? Sort of like, because you have to input, like all this depends on inputting data about behaviors and about success rates. And that's all I assume based on just evidence from the literature. So is that your mm -hmm. sense that where this is most useful is when there's a lot of evidence already that these interventions work? Or do you have examples where there's actually not a whole lot of evidence, but it seems promising, where you're also simulating that? Do you, do you see what I mean? Yeah, I absolutely do. And I think uh, definitely the ideal situation is when we have uh, crisp micro data on the effect of, let's say, a drug or a specific treatment that is um, that is conveyed in sort of a dyadic matter. Uh, so either in the form of a pill or information is being sent. And if we know how the people uh, either are treated for a, a disease or internalize the information, then this type of modeling approach allows us to then understand what does, you know, is this different A in different contexts, in different scales, are there ways to implement this in a more effective way? Things like that. So you can sort of start building from the bottom and then you know go up and then add information and evidence as you as you go up. So that's definitely a great way to do this. Um, very often there is, uh, you know, we we have the saying in agent-based modeling where we will take any data that we have. You know, so if there is great data, wonderful, we will use it. If there is less good data, then thankfully we have access to these large computing resources where we can do these sensitivity analyses to understand which data is important and which isn't. So that's one aspect of using simulations to tell you, is this data important? The, mm. third, the third element is in when we do calibration of deep parameters. So the deep parameters are ones that you may not have ready direct evidence to understand, um, but you do have uh, so ranges of where where a parameter might be. So, for example, the um, fundamental transmission rate uh, between per hour uh, between an infected and susceptible person when it comes to COVID. Let's say. Okay, so you don't exactly know what that is, but you have some ranges of what that should be, and the way you restrict that and try to understand where that is, is by doing these large scale calibration experiments where you're uh, comparing model outputs with empirical data that's aggregated and then doing this inverse modeling process by which you actually do gain insight. And sometimes the signal is very strong and you'll say, oh, the behavior, in this case, behavior, it suggests that behavior is affected you know, dramatically, or in this case, the, there's not much of a signal. Um, so I agree that the best scenario is the scenario you described, but there are um, there's a lot of other work that we do that is not in that idealized scenario as well. Hmm. Interesting. Um, as I said, I have more questions, but there's more questions in the, in the Q&A, so why don't I move to that? Um, so Christopher Hudson asks, um, could you discuss the extent that you have been able to validate any of the ABM simulations using actual separate data sets from the field taken at later points in time? Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a great example. So from the HEPCEP work, uh, I think I mentioned this, there, was, uh, there were two time slices of data and the NHBS 20, 2009 data was used to um, uh, parameterized model and then we use the 2012 data as the targets uh, to get there and so in a sense we are you know there are some parameters that we inferred by 
by making sure that the outputs of our 2009 initialized data matches the 2012 data in terms of trends uh, relative um, relative population uh, prevalence rates and things like that. So that's what we do. You know that that's that's what we do all the time. What yeah. in the context of COVID, um, this is very important because people don't know how people will behave. You know, um, a good example is putting a mitigation measure, like saying um, we're going to disallow indoor dining or indoor bar uh, service. Right. So we hope, I guess, if you're in public health, you hope that has some effect, but we don't really know what the extent of that is effect is. And so we can include certain scenarios that we believe could be possible. And then as time progresses, we see which one of those uh, occur, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's not, it's not exactly what the question asker asked, uh, but that's another process by which we keep on steering our understanding of the problem using newer and newer data. Mm. Yeah, interesting. Um, okay, we have a, another question from Jean Marsh. Um, she asks in the MOUD study, we have evidence that different medications are provided under different regulation and have been around for different lengths of time. Can you quickly review the differences you found among medications and whether you accounted for the length of time on the market and different regulations? So we have not we have not done this. Um, so that's a great question. I think it's uh, it's very relevant. And what another simplification and limitation to what the approach we took so far is that we we know that the that there is a more complex cadence involved in the agent decision making as they proceed through you know getting onboarded for methadone treatment or buprenorphine or naltrexone. Um, but we have not, we have purposefully simplified that aspect to focus on the spatial distribution aspect. But the nice thing about agent based modeling is that if there is data that supports uh, additional complexification and maybe the, the changing um, preferences of the population or how often certain treatments are offered based on how long they've been around, uh, we can incorporate that. Into uh, into modeling studies and see what you know what differences they they, um, they have in terms of health outcomes or you know, we, with the J, with the justice community circulation model we look at things like overdoses and deaths from overdoses and what can be done for them so if we can incorporate a more realistic supply chain of the MOUD that mm -hmm. agents have available mm -hmm. then you know, we can get an aspect of, you know, the, the, the cost effectiveness aspect of things as well. Yeah, yeah, that's very, very interesting. Just um, adding on to Jean's question. I mean, to me, um, part of what I see her asking is, is so you have, you attach behaviors onto the agent um, who has, it's a, a people with OUD, um, and then they react to the location of different facilities. But then there's also the, um, the pr providers or the executive directors in those facilities that are also like maybe agent B <laughs> that is making decisions based on regulations and payment and other an, another set of behaviors. And I, I wonder, do you have models where you kind of have um, do you see what I mean? You have the, mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. you know, the, the mm -hmm. individual and then yeah. you have the, the organizational level, which is also reacting to a set of behaviors. Absolutely. Uh, so that's, that's, you know, that's, you know, I, I hate to keep saying this, but that's yet another way in which the modeling approach allows a sort of hierarchical agency in the model so that you don't just have, you know, uh, you know, naked agents that are just completely self-directed, but you can have sort of a policy making agent or policy making agents that are trying to sort of understand what the best approach is. And then you can see the agents, the you know, the population agents reacting to different um, policies as they, you know, as they are uh, <laughs> tried on the population. So that is, it. so we have done things like that in the realm of um, rare earth supply chains where we're looking mm -hmm. at more from the organizational point of view of the supply chain, making uh, decisions based on the economics um, 
yeah so i mean again the answer is yes i think that would be very very interesting yeah i think in health policy that would be really fascinating to be modeling uh, the hierarchical models right. um, because it's that's the complexity within the in the field right. um yeah let me just add one more thing to that. So we're not stuck with agent-based modeling for all of the processes that we include in a model. You know, we can include other types of models inside an agent-based model. So you can have the agents, for example, all be agents and have decision-making capabilities, et cetera, but you can model some background process like, let's say, weather or economy or some other thing with a simpler method, you know, because okay that's sufficient, for example, and you can have the agents reacting to that as well. So it's a very inclusive methodology. It doesn't require you to break everything down into rules and rule sets, et cetera. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. Um, so we have another question um, from Unsut uh, Young. Um, I hope I didn't mispronounce your name. Um, thank you for a great presentation. I have a clarifying question in the HEPs, uh, HEPs that optimal combination interventions, combination of recruitment is suggested for best result. How yeah. long optimal combination intervention should be provided to achieve 2030 WHO, goal, uh, WHO goals based on the finding? Yeah. Um, he writes in parens, my understanding was stay in the combination for in-partner and full network for 10 years would be helpful. That's right. Honestly, this is somebody who has a lot of knowledge about this topic. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so the idea there is that the um, the when we choose a combination, a specific combination in, you know, as, as depicted by those um, sort of pie charts, we run that combination of interventions for the full 10 years and we're comparing uh, other combinations that also ran for 10 years. And that's how we're making the assessment. So he, he's absolutely right. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you said, I think is the name. Um, Unsuk, I think. I yeah. hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. That's yeah. the. So I, I think you're absolutely right that that is um, th that that you understood it correctly. Okay. Um, so I have a, another question about. Um, I thought the the study, um, Stacy Lindau's study around um, kind of you know. Uh, there's problems of lack of information, good information about um, access to be able to make good health decision making, you need information. And as I understand it, you were kind of simulating um, uh, different possibilities of increasing um, information. And that sort of got me thinking about this, this larger question of information in the healthcare realm. And, and a, a really important area today, of course, is around um, vaccinations, right? And there's a lot of misinformation about vaccinations. And then you have the CDC and other public health um, experts trying to really put out as much good evidence about vaccinations or you know, whatever it is, but let's just stay on vaccinations. And it's this continual battle with the misinformation. And so I wonder if you're aware of any of this kind of modeling where you actually have this com these competing forces of good information and bad information, and you know I, I don't quite have a hypothesis, but it yeah, seems yeah. to be a super important question right now in this this obviously hugely important area where we're thinking about COVID and the release of vaccination. Hey, absolutely. So there are people there, there are people at Argonne that are working on the the general idea of misinformation in in applying agent based models uh, to it. I. You know, I think it's a, it's a, it's a nice way to combine the work that people do in um, looking through the the massive amounts of data that we have on online communication, et cetera, and then translating that into something that you can use, you can implement as a model to then try to see if there are any interventions you can think of to reduce or to to amplify the message, uh, you know, the, the hopefully the, be, the good messages out there. I mean, it's not, this is a, this is a truly interdisciplinary area of work, right? You really need people who understand the ins and outs of misinformation and, and, and how people behave in response to misinformation, how they spread information, things like that. So I, right. I think it's an extremely interesting and timely for multiple reasons uh, topic area. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> there's another question from David Innes. Um, he asks, uh, this would seem to have applicability to a whole range of marketing initiatives, including public interest initiatives like voter turnout. Um, would you agree with that? I, so I would like to agree with that. I don't, I, in the sense that I don't know that that's not true, but I don't have personal, um, I don't have personal experience doing this, but um, it sounds like it could be interesting, um, especially if, you know, what, one of the things that maybe I didn't stress enough um, is that compared to other methods like maybe micro simulation, agent-based models really um, are operational when you have interaction, you know, or when you have networks uh, along which things occur. So you basically, you can't just simulate each individual through let's say a natural history of uh, cancer, for example, um, because you know the cancer is sort of, it happens to them and then interactions with maybe health providers is, are important, but not with other people who may or may not have cancer. But for all the problems that um, we spoke about today, there's this fundamental notion of interaction, whether it's disease transmission, information transmission. So if there's an aspect of public interest for voter turnout that capitalizes on the network structure of how people ingest you know, information and then how they act as multipliers to um, get more people to turn out to vote, et cetera, I think it would be interesting. I just don't have expertise. Um, and I don't, I, I'm not sure exactly who does have expertise in that area. Yeah, yeah. I wonder, you know, um, NIH has a whole translational science arm to, you know, a number of the um, research, the kind of basic science that, that was, that happened actually quite a while ago now where they began requiring that all basic science have a translational arm to it. And, um, and again, this seems like a, a really interesting avenue. It's not, it's not translation in the sense of kind of doing community engagement, but it would be translation in terms of thinking about the scaling up. And I just wonder, do you know, are people thinking about agent-based modeling on the translational science side um, to NIH? Um, I mean, I have to assume so. I, I, so anything that involves the, you know, scaling up from this sort of dyadic, um, dyadic treatment to something more that involves sort of the social aspects, whether that's, you know, overcoming inertia or making sure that information is available or mm -hmm. you're making access more, um, making access to some resources more readily available to people. I have to assume that there is, I don't, I don't know. That's something that I should probably look further into. Um, but I'd be yeah, curious you know, for people that are more steeped in the translation um, area, if they've seen things like that and if there's anything interesting to consider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so one more question, we're, we're getting close to um, when we should probably stop, yeah. but um, let's take this question from Eric Chandler. Um, he asks, in the HEPSEP model, did social network links depend on homophilia, homophily of yeah. agent attributes? Um, in practice, are outcomes sensitive to the specific network realization or just the gross structure? Yeah, so uh, we're actually doing a lot of work now on um, combining meta-analyses meta uh, that give us better, even better than the current HEPSEP network structure. And what we're doing is using methods like uh, exponential random graph models to generate different stochastic, different random realization of networks exactly to um, understand how sensitive are the model outputs to the, you know, to the, to the basically network structure. But to answer the initial question, yes, they are dependent on uh, agent attributes. Um, but either whether they where they live, um, I think there's an I think there's an age aspect to it as well. Certainly, the ones that we do now, um, the networks we construct are based on um, um, race mis mixing structures, uh, distance, uh, things like that. So I, I, hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, definitely. Um, oh, 
just, I think that's it. I, I don't think we have any other questions in the chat, um, but this was fascinating, a uh, really fascinating talk. And it's, I think it's so helpful for those of us who study public health and health policy to, to just sort of understand this method and, and, and understand the power and application that it has. So I really appreciate you coming and, and uh, well, not coming, staying, but zooming in to give us a talk. <laughs> It was my pleasure, and uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Oh, absolutely. Okay, thanks so much. Um, and thanks, everybody, for coming. I really um, appreciate your participation. Uh, Keith, did you want to say anything to close us out? Or Nope, we're ready. <laughs> okay, all. all right. Thank you With very that, much. Thanks, everybody.